stupid button, <laughs> which would have been just as bad. OK. Basically put, today we're talking about Linux user management. And with all operating systems, or at least all modern operating systems, user management is, management is important. Um, essentially, it's what determines what you're allowed to do and not allowed to do outside of just the raw permissions. If you don't have a user, you can't get in. And since most Unix slash Linux systems are considered multi-user, it means that people have multiple, multiple people can hit the same machine at the same time and work cooperatively on the same machine. Um, so when you decide to start managing users under Linux, essentially you have to define what group they belong to and what their username is. And when a user is created, there's a file called passwd. It's stored under the etc directory. And I'm going to go open up mine and show you guys what's in it. Okay, so when you look inside of it, you, as the slide shows that you've got a username, and then you've got an X, and you've got some numbers, and then you've got a path, and what shell they are. So this is their home directory. That's their shell. That's the username. Uh, these are the IDs for the person, user and group IDs. If I go back to the slideshow, it's hard to actually have them up at the same time. Field one's the login name. Field two's the password field. As you can see now, it's just set to X. There once was a time that a person's password was stored right here, where this X is. There used to be a password. And then they thought they'd get clever, and then they made the password a hash. And then they, they realized they still weren't being clever, and they moved the passwords, and they put them somewhere else. Um, it used to be lots of fun about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, to use Google to pull people's past WD files. And then you run it through a parser, and you get people's MD5 passwords, and you run that through a, through a rainbow table, and you know everybody's passwords. It was lots of fun. Um, the third field is the user ID. Essentially, every user has a unique ID in the system. It's your number. For example, here at the school, your unique ID would be your student number. Um, inside each Linux system, each person will have their own unique ID. And as you can see, it, for actual users, it starts at a really high number. It starts at 1,000, whereas services may have a lower ID. Um, the second field, the second number is the group ID. What is your primary group? In other words, you, when you get, your account gets created, you get a primary group. And normally, it creates a group with the same, same name as your name. So if you create a Daniel G user, there'll be a Daniel G group. And very often, they'll have the same ID. Not all the time, but most of the time, they'll have the same ID. It's coincidental that they have the same ID, but it's just how it works out sometimes. Um, the next field after that is other information or a comment. Linux tends to like to use that next field for a nice version of your name. And apparently, I couldn't hit the shift button when I hit, typed in my last name. Yay for me. Um, there's a couple of other slots in here. As you can see, a few other commas. So there's, there's room for other things in here if you want to. The next path is your home directory. As you can see, here's my home slash, slash home slash Daniel G. And then you got your default shell. So unless you change your shell yourself, as in you can ch override the shell by in your profile, this is the shell that's going to be applied to you every time you log in. So if you don't override your shell, you'll get whatever this one says. Um, as you can see, there's some odd-looking shells in here. Uh, bin false. It means this user is not allowed to log in. Strangely enough, they also have user bin no login which also means this user is not allowed to log in. And the most common one is actually the user has been no login, but they also got these weird bin false jobs. Um, and a lot of these are for uh, processes. 
as opposed to uh, system level users. So that's the content of the past WD file. Now, normally, if you want to play with it, you have to be root. You can't really mess with the past WD file unless you're root. However, anybody can look inside of it. Essentially, your user has to have permissions to view the content so it can get some basic information out of there every time you log in. Therefore, it needs to be able to see the contents, which is a little special um, when you think about it, um, which is why it was such a terrible idea to store the passwords in this file, because there once was a time you could. And when you talk about how old Unix systems weren't always secure, um, it was actually pretty amazing how it used to be if the system administrator didn't change the default password on the admin account. At my old high school, we ran a QNIX network. They never changed the administrator's password. I opened up the first book on the shelf, installing your system. The administrator's password was there on a piece of paper. I was an administrator 10 minutes later. It was cool. And also, all the pa everybody's passwords are also stored in the past WD file back then, which was really fun, because they knew everybody's passwords. No, it was even more hilarious when I could get into the, the grade system. <laughs> nah, I didn't need to ch didn't need to check my grades. That was that was too obvious. But you know, it was entertaining to know how well you how well or badly your friends were doing, dude. Buy me some pop, I'll tell your parents what you did in the last test. <laughs> you know, blackmail for fun and profit. So the good news is you can't do that anymore. Uh, they've hidden it away. Um, you can't change the contents of the, of the past WD file unless uh, you use this appropriate commands, such as how to, the commands to change your shell, the command to change your password, that kind of stuff. Um, the commands to change your group, but usually you can't change your own group because then you could make yourself someone you're not. Uh, therefore, we tend to not allow people to change their own group. Root can change their group, on the other hand. Um, all passwords are stored in ETC shadow, and only root and root processes can look at it. And as you can see, The passwords are kind of weird looking. That is not my password, by the way. Um, each entry in each et cetera shadow contains user's login, their encrypted password, a uh, number of fields that have to do with when the password expires. So if you set an expiry date, those fields will change. Um, typical entry will look like as on the screen. Uh, the username is up to eight characters. It's case sensitive. It's all usually lowercase. Um, it's an exact match to your username and the password past WD file. If they don't match, guess what? You don't have a valid password. Sucks to be you. Uh, encrypted passwords. Have an exclamation mark placed before the encrypted password to indicate the password has not been set or account has been disabled. You can see there's an exclamation mark here. Um, so basically put the asterisk, show there's no password set on those. And you can see root has a good password. Um, these don't have a password set. I have a password set. This one, the user is disabled. There's characters in here that mean different things. Now, the next field you'll see is last time was the password changed. It tells you the number of days since Epoch. Epoch, for those of you that don't know, is January 1st, 1970, midnight. It's a magical time in computer land. I actually don't remember the history why that date was picked, but essentially that's the date 
starts at zero for all computers. The minimum number of days required between password changes. So the next entry would show this one here, shows how many days between password changes. So if this is set to 90, it forces you to change your password every 90 days. The next one is the maximum number of days. Sorry, this is the one that sets how many days your password is good for. So if I set this to zero and set this to 90, it means I can change my password any time, any given 90 days. I'm the, at, at the end of 90 days, my password expires and I must set a new one. And if I remember right, it's actually going to disable your account until somebody resets your password. The next one is number of days. Shoot. The number of days before the password is set to expire, you will get a warning. So you go to log in. And in this case, it says seven days. Seven days before the password expires. Warn him. Uh, yes. Yes, if you're sitting there with a dumb terminal and you're permanently logged in, um, it will not check you. So your password, you could theoretically expire your password and not realize you did it. On the other hand, very f I've seen very few systems that don't log you out after a set amount of time. Which is the next one? Um, well, not quite. Inactive is the number of days after the password is expired that the account is disabled. So after X number of days, the password is expired. If you wait another five days or whatever, you can tell it after five days and they still haven't changed their password, disable the account. And then and after that, there's actually an expiry, which, you know, further number of days, um, an absolute date. In other words, you can actually say after a certain date, this account will never work again. So you could say, I've created this account and it's going to die um, say June 1st, 2019, you have to calculate how many days since January 1st to then, and that will tell you when the person's account's going to expire. Now, as Mark, as he indicated, if you stay logged into a Linux system, it will um, not check your password as you maneuver through the system. A good system administrator will force logouts on a regular basis. Um, depending how you're connected, if you're connecting using an SSH client, uh, there's ways of telling it after one hour and there's nothing being transmitted through the SSH client, disconnect it. Uh, back in the days of the old serial terminals, and for those of you that don't know what that is, it, Anybody here remember the computers with the green black screens? And you walked by and your face felt like it was glowing. You go home and you had this weirdest green tinge to your skin. Not radiation poisoning at all. Those old terminals. Uh, often on those serial lines, uh, they'd have a routine running that would check to see how long since the last time the user did anything. And then it would kill the connection and reset it. Essentially what those green screens are, they're actually serial terminals that do the same thing. So when you open up a <coughs> an SSH client and you connect remotely using SSH or a Telnet client, if I want to go back a few more years, and you connect remotely using a Telnet client, those dumb terminals did the same thing. But it used a serial line. So essentially you'd go to connect, you turn on the machine, it would actually reach out and ping the server and say, I want to talk to you via this port and the server would allow it. So then it starts monitoring what's happening with this port. And if it's not in login mode, it checks after a while and it would expire you. Um, but there has been instances of people doing bad things because their passwords, their machines don't log out automatically. So a good network administrator makes sure people get logged out automatically after a while. Which leads me to the next command. User add. Anybody want to take a guess what user add does? It adds a user. Now, it has a few useful options. 
dash D, so you can tell it to use a different home directory than the standard home directory. Uh, G, you can give them an initial group name. Capital G, you tell them, you can say this guy belongs to more than this specific group. S dash C is you can add a comment just as a person's nice name. And dash N is do not create a group with the same name as his username, but instead add it to an existing group. So you uh, the often on multi-tenant systems, that's something they're going to do is they're going to give, they'll create a user for you, but you don't get your own group. You have your own home folder, and everything in there belongs to you, but you don't have your own group anymore. They make you belong to another group by default. Expiry date, what the default login shell is, et cetera, et cetera. Then there's dash M. In other words, if you specify a directory and you haven't created it, it will create it for you. And then uh, dash D is to change some default values. So if you do dash D, you can set some of these to have default values. And now to create a user for you. Because everybody needs a John Doe. So his home directory is going to be home J Doe. Dash M says, I'm going to actually force the directory to be created. Uh, dash G is, what group is he going to belong to? Um, that's up to you if you want to change what it's going to be. I'm choosing not to feed that one. Um, however, I can add him to the admin group, so he has administrative privileges. Not necessarily the best idea, but you can. Okay, so I'm going to add a user, his Nice name is John Doe. That's the comment, so you see it's in quote marks, so it respects the spaces. If you don't have the quote marks, it will not respect those spaces. Um, dash D, so I'm specifying the guy's home directory. I'm putting him in the admin group. I hope it's a called admin. I don't remember off the top of my head. Uh, I'm going to set his default shell to be bash, just like everybody else. And the, user's, the username is going to be, well, J Doe. And the admin user group does not belong, exist, of course not. I'll play dangerously. I'll put them in as part of the root user group. There you go. Apparently, I don't have an admin group. I have a, gr I have a, root, a root group, though. And I'm sure anybody who's actually done any kind of network admin just looked at what I just did and went, oh, my god, no. You shouldn't create a user and put him in group, the group of root. That means he can do anything root can do. Not the best idea. Um, but, you know. It's a, a thing you can do. So if I go look at the home directory, now you'll see that I have a JDO directory in here. And it's got the base directory structure that you'd find. And if I want to become John Doe, I can. You can see. And you can see that he belongs to the J Doe group and also the root group, which is kind of cool. Um, there's not much more you can do to this guy other than I could also change the password on him, which you really should.
which is you use the passwd command. You guys have seen passwd before. You used it during the first lab. Which um, is the basic commands you'd use when you first create a user. So basically it creates their directory, sets their shell, you can set their password, and then you move on from there. The next command you'd have after this is if user add adds a user, what command would you use to get rid of the user? <coughs> user del. <coughs> user del. Delete the user. And the good news is it has a heck of a lot less options. It's easier to remember what it can do. So we know jdo is here. If I go user del dash r jdo, so dash r removes the home directory. If you don't include the dash r, it'll remove their ability to log in, but it leaves all their files behind. And if you've ever worked um, somewhere where you terminate a person, you tend to nuke their accounts, but you don't nuke their data. Why? Because you may need it later. A, they may have some data you don't know he has, or B, he has some data you need to take him to court. Take your pick. Or C, he has data the police want. That one's not good. So, you won't regularly use dash r, but if I if I were to do the dash r, actually, let me add another user first, so I can show you what's out the difference. So I create another John Doe. And if I look in here, you'll see there's jdo and jdo2. So if I do user del jdo2, okay, just so I can prove what's happening. There's jdo2. He's been added to the past wd file. No errors. JDO2 is gone. However, his home directory is still there. That means the user is unable to log in. He has no rights to the system. There's no security holes left for him to exploit. And all his files are still there. What you will notice, though, is this. Notice up here how my home directory is Daniel G, and JDO's home directory is JDO. And now all we've got is numbers. It's because this directory belongs to group 1002. Well, to user 1002 and group 1002, but that group and user no longer exists. So what does it do at that point? Is it just displays the numbers of the, what the group used to be. And how would you fix that? You'd change the ownership. Change it to root, change it to something else. Capital R, belong to root. So you take the ownership of it after you've nuked the user if you want to delete their home directory. A, um, dot user dot group. So if I would just want to change the group, yeah, root, root. If I want to change the ownership to root and change the group to Daniel J, I can do that. So now it's owned by root, but Daniel G it has the group on it. Cute. Yes. The answer is yes. It supports both syntaxes. Uh, so now I'm going to do the user del once more time. One more time. But this time I'm going to do jdo with the dash r argument added to it. And you'll see a little error message came up saying that var mail jdo does not exist for the mail spool. A mail account was never created for this user. However, his directory is gone. 
JDO 2 is still there, but JDO is gone. What the dash R does, it looks everywhere that belongs to JDO. So it'll nuke his home directory, it'll delete his mail spool if you're using internal mail. Uh, it'll delete a few other things here and there that are specific to when your user gets created. Now I'm going to recreate my John Doe. Okay, there's my John Doe's back. Yay. Um, so that's user delete. Now we have user mod. User mod allows you to modify most of the information uh, that's stored in ETC password, uh, the password file that has to do with the user account. Um, there's lots of options. They're similar to um, the ones you'd get as user, user add. C to add the comment. So if you want to give the person a nice name, you can give them a nice name or a not nice name, whatever your choice may be. Um, <coughs> dash D allows you to change the person's home directory. So let's say you created originally and the guy's home directory was J Doe and you'd realize it should have been John D. You can actually use, do a user mod, and if you include the dash M argument, just like you do in the user create, it'll create the new directory. It will not copy. It basically, it's give the guy a fresh home directory clean. And, no, it creates a new one. Let's, let's try to answer your question. So, we got a J Doe, which, you know, if we do right here, you can see there's J Doe and there's his home. So if I go user mod and it's dash D, dash M, and the user is called J Doe. I do this, and if I go, it actually renamed it. No, not really. That was a good question, though. Because last time I played with this, unless it's a system level difference, last time I did this, it created a new directory so I could create new fresh profiles for people. It would create a new profile for them, not they would basically give them a virgin profile. This renamed it. Okay, it's just as good. Um, but now you know the difference. Um, some of the other arguments you'll find in here is changing their initial group. You can change what group they belong to. You can change what other groups they belong to, so you can give them, allow them to belong to more than one group. You can change what shell they're using. Expired date. All the same arguments as basically when you create a new user. Um, the only difference is, is you can lock it and unlock the user account. So if I go back here, and oh, that's not going to work. I got this thing auto logging me in. So I'm logged into this window as JDO. It's really small. Um, but I'm just going to show you guys what happens if I expire the person. So I'm going to do a mod. The heck was that argument again? Capital L, JDO. Now, if I go and cat the password file, uh, no, the shadow file, you'll see right here there's an exclamation mark. And this is saying this password has been disabled. So if I go back to here and I try to log in as my handy uh, JDO user, you'll see the big long pause and it says login incorrect. I know I typed in the guy's password right. It's just not letting me in. 
because it's been locked out. So if I come back over here and I reinitialize him by Hello? Now, if I, I, since I re-enabled him, I should be able to just log in as him once again. So the two, the two commands I just messed with is dash L to lock it, dash U to unlock. And they're capitalized, not lowercase. When you look at the slideshow, you'll notice This way. The U here, I can't highlight on the screen, it just changes slides. The U looks like it's uppercase. This is an uppercase U. Just stating. It's not lowercase, it's uppercase. Um, and it basically adds an exclamation mark. Theoretically, you could go modify the past WD file yourself by hand and shove the exclamation mark in there. It'll do the exact same thing. Should you do that? There are just some files on an operating system you should not play with. Yes? You're done. Yeah. Yeah, you go pull a backup. And actually, believe it or not, that's actually a file that only gets backed up once in a blue moon. Usually, once you set up the initial system, and normally when a user gets created, it's pretty much the only time those files get touched. And depending on what kind of operating system or what kind of usage the server is getting, like where I work, our users don't log into the Linux systems. They log into a web app that sits on top of it. So they have their own logins that have nothing to do with what's happening under the behind the scenes. So when does that file get backed up? The first time. After the system's been created. And after that, it's just deltas of the server. So, you know, you might be pulling a backup that's five years old, which will have its own challenges. It's, it might suck. So the rule is there's some files in Linux operating system you don't touch by hand. Um, the passwd file is sketchy. You should really use the user mod commands to, to make the modifications. It'll do them properly. Um, the shadow file, never, ever, ever touch. It's just not a good place to be playing. Uh, there's another one called the cron files. Don't touch those by hand either. I think we cover those later in the term. Uh, they have a really specific format, and if you touch them and you break something, you might, might as well screw your system over because all the automated jobs stop working. And uh, Unix-like operating systems like their automated jobs. So the next command is chsh. Change shell. You can change the login shell associated with a user account. Um, if you don't give it, it will prompt you. Um, you can find out. What the shells are. No, oh, because I suck at typing. So it, it prompts you which shell you want to feed it. It gives you the default one if you don't provide one, which is cool. Um, you can always install other shells, such as ZSH or just straight up SH. Um, for example, if I want to change this guy's shell to be just regular SH, I can. So now if I were to go you'll see right here that his shell was changed to SH. It's pretty straightforward. Now the good news is it created a passwd with a dash file. And the one with the dash file is the previous version of that file. So, like you said, what happens if you nuke <coughs> the passwd file? Hopefully, you have at least a dashed version so most of your system is still intact. 
No, uh, CHSH does it. Uh, actually, a lot of the commands, the user mod will also create a backup of it in case you do something wrong. Yeah, but it only keeps the last copy. So it doesn't keep versions of the file. It says, here's the previous, here's what's here now. We're going to make a copy of it. This is what we're going to call it. Then we're going to save our changes. You make another change, it overwrites the backup. So it's one, it's a one level undo, not a multi level undo. But that's usually enough. If you want more than one level of undo, you should be copying those files elsewhere. Okay, yeah. Uh, version control is a good thing, um, which is something I don't teach you at level one. Um, version control is a good thing. We actually, one of our servers where I work, where we do actually have some user accounts, we tend to actually have. Um, these two files are actually uh, hard links to a system that automatically versions. So every time you change the file, it makes a copy and saves it somewhere else. And it, it automatically gets committed to our subversion repository. It's a really nifty trick. Our, yeah, so every time, I do a, after, every time we do a change user, it actually rewrites that file. When it rewrites it, it gets committed to the uh, repo automatically. So that way we can go back and forever and see every change that was ever done on that file and who did it, which is going to be root because it's the only person that can make those changes. Uh, but it's still good to know. Um, so, so far you've seen how to remove a user, how to change a user. There's one more layer to Linux security, and that's groups. And essentially, Groups is a mechanism to allow people to be able to do, to share resources. Um, whether you're accessing a directory structure or accessing specific programs, uh, you give permissions to a group to run certain programs. And if those people belong to that group, they'll be able to run the programs. So if I want to be a divisive person, I could say group A, group B. And I could say group A is allowed to do the tests because they belong in group A. Group B, you don't get to do tests. No, you just don't get to do them. So because I gave a group permission to do a test, as a group, even though you all have your own accounts and your own users and your own individual group, because you belong to group A, I can add you to a program which allows you to take tests. Or there could be a folder where I've stored the assignments. And group B is allowed to see the assignments, but group A is not allowed to see the assignments. Because you belong to group B, you can do assignments. Group A can do tests based on what the groups do. Um, normally, a user is associated to a group based on what they need to do. Uh, there'll be several groups. Um, anybody here ever play with a Windows network at all? Windows NT? Windows Server? No? You should play with that if you get a chance. It's entertaining. Uh, Microsoft has made the whole you belong to a group thing very easy. Click, 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 click. Easier than on a Mac because they don't like being network citizens. Being a network citizen, they're, they're all individuals. I shouldn't make fun of them, but they're so easy to make fun of. <laughs> Essentially, in Windows, on a, if you work on a domain, for example, how all of you log into your different products here at the school, right? You have a common, you have what they call a single sign-on. You have a username. This username gives you access to certain resources. And depending on who you are, you have access to different resources based on your user level or what groups you belong to. So for example, um, in a development shop, and we're going to talk a shop that has more than three guys working out of, the out of the local Starbucks, you'll have different departments. You'll have the engineering department. You'll have tech support. You'll have accounting and sales. And there'll be different resources on the network available to each group. 
For example, do you want the accounts to be able to get into your, your version control system? Probably not. Uh, do you want the engineers to be able to go play around in accounts receivable? Probably not. Therefore, you'd create groups that they belong to, and you'd have a group like called accounting, a group called engineering, a group called tech support. And often the, uh, the tech support guys will have to ask the engineering department for help if there's a bug and they don't know how to fix it, or they need to know find a workaround. The engineer may need to have access to the same resources as the tech support guys. So often you'll have the engineers also belong to tech support. That means they can actually see the resources of both groups. Same idea applies to Linux systems. Uh, you have a bunch of groups. You can give permissions to, or change the ownership of certain folders and certain applications to belong to certain to, to groups. And then you give you add the person to a group, and suddenly they have access to those resources. Normally, it's the system admins that take care of that. A regular user should not be able to create groups. It's not a good idea. Now, there's two files, just like there's a passwd and a shadow file. There's also a group file and a G shadow file. They're in the same spots as the passwd file. Um, the contents are significantly different than the passwd file. As you can see, there's a quick example here, but I'll actually pull up a real And you'll see in here where root has one user called JDO. The ADM has two users. Apparently, my user has access to the CD-ROM group, which means I'm allowed to mount a CD-ROM. If I didn't belong in this group, I couldn't actually look at CDs. Just saying. Um, You'll have a few other ones in here. LP admin, um, my user, again, has access to that group. Uh, what's LP admin? That's printer admin. So I can manage my own printers. In case, you know, it's kind of cool because you could uh, set up a Linux system. You have permissions for yourself. You can do whatever you want. Then you give your roommate permissions, and they can't touch the printer. It's great. They can't print, waste your ink by not letting them access it. Now, the parameters are as follows. The first one is the group name. The second one is the password. Usually, password is not used. That's why it's empty or blank. Theoretically, you could store an encrypted password. Um, you can have privileged groups where you need an extra password to get at it. Uh, the group ID. There's the number for the group. And then the group list. So that's the list of users that belong to that group. So that's all the bits and pieces you find in there. So the name of the group, the password, what the number of the group is, and who belongs in it. And as I said up here, you'll see that the ADM group has two people in it. I was trying to type admin earlier. It's an ADM. Yay. Yay. No, that, yeah, this is the usernames over here. That's the group name on that side. So first field is the group name. Second field is a password, which is not used. Third one is the ID of the group. And then everything after that is a common delimited list of all the users that belong to that group. So is group both a user and a group? Yes. Okay. Um, I may have actually nuked my machine a little bit when I messed with the root user earlier. But that's OK. Um, th automatically. It's automatical. Um, essentially, system level users get an ID below 1,000. Regular users get from 1,000 to uh, 65,534, which is no group. So if you have no group, your ID is 65,000. 
and change. Um, a no group user would be a group that has the letters. The user doesn't have a group, so he's not allowed to touch any resources that have a group defined. Unless you create a folder that has no user, no group, then this is the only thing they'd be allowed to see. It's a good thing sometimes. Sometimes you don't want them to touch things they're not supposed to touch. Therefore, you take away any group privileges they have by assigning them no group. And as you can see, no group doesn't have any users associated to it. So if I were to make John Doe and change his group, I could put him in part of no group, and then he'd lose rights to a whole lot of things. I suppose right now he can do anything root can do. It'd be the other way around. Well, you'd create the user with all the basic settings, then you'd add them to a group later. So you'd create their basic system account, then once you find out what their permissions are, what they're allowed to see, then you'd modify them to give them additional groups or remove groups as needed. Uh, by default, it'll create them a user and a group, uh, but the group is the same thing as their username. So that means that all they can see is the things that belongs to them. If they are um, set to no group, all they can do is create things that they they can only see things that they're the owner of, but not things that they might be part of the group of. Um, it, it's basically like a sieve, right? So at the top is everyone, and as you remove what groups they belong to, their diameter, you know, doesn't fit through the last hole. So it gets a little more dangerous that way. That makes sense, the visual. Okay, so there's also a G shadow file which contains lines with uh, colon separated fields. It has a group name, an encrypted password, and the group administrators and the group members. Um, that's if you want to set a password on a group. It's a feature I don't think I've ever seen implemented or used. Normally, it's only if you want to have a super like a, a two pet, almost like a two phase authentication for certain resources where if you go to change directories into a, you go CD into a directory that belongs to a special group, you'll end up getting prompted for a second password. I think every time you log in, you have to provide both passwords. Otherwise, you can't see what it actually does. It's kind of interesting. Um, not something you see on a regular basis. Now, in Linux, users belong to a group which is called in their initial group. Um, they're set up by administrators when they created the account. The user doesn't need to do anything to belong to this group. It's automatically associated with them. In other words, if I create a new user called J John Doe, it creates a group called John Doe. John Doe belongs to John Doe. That's their initial group. You don't need to do anything else past that. It's created automatically. It makes sure that the stuff that they create belongs to them and only them. So if I were to and here you can see I'm logged in as Daniel G and these are all files that belong to Daniel G and if I were to go I touched a butt and if I look at it up here you'll see that it, it belongs to me. I'm touching my own butt. And um, so when you do the initial group create, it um, creates a group. You belong to that group. Anything you create belongs to that group also. That means it's yours and only yours to work with. However, a person can belong to multiple groups and it's controlled by the groups, the group file. And in theory, you can even switch between groups you're acting as. And, of course, we have the matching commands that go with this. Group add. Oh, boy. 
I created a group called students. So if I type in groups, that's who I belong to. If I go no S, you'll see that a group called students was created with an ID of 1002. Created a second one. You can see now there's student two at the bottom right here. There's also group Dell, which of course allows me to get rid of a group. So once again, if I do this, you'll see students two is gone. So student one is there, student two was there. Now it's gone. Now, there's a few other commands we can use. And you also can do a group mod. And you can do a, a few little things in it. But I'm actually going to pull up the dash help for it so you can see. So if you ever know you're not sure how to use a command, by the way, there's the good old man page which gives you lots and lots of information. You can also go dash dash help, which gives you the nice short version of it. And you can do a few things. You can change the group ID. So if you want to give it a magic number of your own choosing, you can. Uh, you can give it a new name. You're allowed to have a duplicate group ID, which strikes me as a bad idea, uh, but you can do that. Um, you can set a password by setting using dash p. Um, and then there's also the dash r, which allows you to set a default root level pass uh, directory. Um, ch root limits how far up the tree a person is allowed to move. So for example, what is the root folder of the Linux operating system? Slash. But if you do a change root, a ch root, you could actually make the home directory be slash home slash students. And if you even go cd slash, you won't be able to move up past home students. Um, it, it's like a jail where you're restricted where the person can move. You can, like I said, you can change the name of a group, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, and back in the day where people actually would log into a system and they actually have a command prompt, and they'd actually have to type in the commands to actually launch what they're using, that was you know common to jail people in. Um, most good network admins would actually set an automatic program that would launch so the, student, the students, ha the employees would not steal a command prompt. Uh, but on systems that were a little odder, like VAX systems, um, they didn't quite work like that. And you couldn't force people into a program at first login. So you had to change their, you had to jail them, which says you're only allowed to operate in this. Uh, use web hosting, shared hosting providers. You set up a website for yourself, go to Host Papa or uh, that god awful one from the, the States, whatever it's called. Eh? You know, GoDaddy. <laughs> so when you set up with GoDaddy, often they'll give you, and when they give you shell access, you get a jail, a jailed-in version of the shell. They allow to play in your little sandbox, and you can't leave your sandbox. So your home root folder is your your low. It doesn't mean that you're you don't have access to the system level commands. It just means you're not allowed to move out of the side of your box. Uh, the Unix system and the Linux system will manage your path so you can execute commands. But it says you're not allowed to leave these folders. So this is your play, your sandbox. And so instead of having to take your toys and go play in your own sandbox, they tell you what your sandbox is. Yes. For a little bit more money. Just a bit more. Um, so... You can issue the groups command, which tells you what groups a user belongs to. And I've got 
ready groups shows what groups do I belong to. If you go and you can actually type, it shows you what, if you type somebody's name, it'll show you what groups they belong to. And as I can see, the Daniel G user belongs to Daniel G, belongs to, belongs to the pseudo group, which is magic. Uh, allows you to bypass security. Uh, plug dev, which means I'm allowed to plug in a device and actually have it be recognized. Uh, printer admin, and I can access sample shares, which is kind of cool because I don't have sample installed on this machine, so I don't know why it gave me that group, but you know, I'm part of that group. There's another command called uh, new group. So you can change what group you belong to temporarily by issuing the new group command. If you require a password, you are prompted for the password at that point. So let's say you work in a sensitive environment. Let's go with CSIS. We'll talk about sensitive. And you're a network admin in CSIS, and there's certain directories you're nobody's allowed to touch except for a very specific group of people. And you want to seed into that directory and list the contents, and you can't because you're not part of that group. But you know the password to become part of that group. So you go new group space, and you give it a a magic use, uh, group name. So this would be super secret. Enter, it'll prompt you for the super secret password. And suddenly you belong to the super secret group. And in you go. You can now go look at the files inside the super secret folder. It's kind of cool. Um, not commonly used. Um, I'm guessing a lot of this is probably legacy from way back in the old Unix days of how things were done. Um, but if you are running a shared server with other people and you want to have a folder that nobody can see except you and your friend, or you keep touching but, just to prove that you've logged in, then you could actually make everybody part of that super group and with a password, and only those that have that know the password can actually look at the, at the fact that you touched a but. Such it is. But that's essentially what the command does. Now, there's G password. So that's used to administer the shadow file, the group's shadow file. Uh, any given group can have an administrator, members, and a password. So you create a group called Super Friends, and you can give them a password. So I'm going to go not super fried. That's the morning after. All right, so I got a group called Super Friends, and nobody's part of the group. And I decided I'm going to define a group administrator. So I could go I'm going to make myself a group administrator. And it helps if you actually give it the group name. And now, if I were to go you'll see right here, super friends. Doesn't have a password set. And the administrator is me. Now, in theory, I could add a user. Um, text the argument mod again. There, dash P. So I'm going to set a password of, well, something. Actually, make it leet.
So now if I were to cat the contents of that G shadow, how amazing is that? The password's in clear text. Which is kind of gross. I'm not part of the group, so I'm not allowed to change in. Actually, that's kind of weird that the password was not encrypted. Because I'm pretty sure normally it's encrypted. It definitely should be encrypted. Cool. <laughs> so I think I broke my uh, Linux box earlier. It's not encrypting my passwords anymore. How cool is that? No. That's the best part. Yeah, because if you go look at this slide, it says the password should be encrypted. That doesn't look encrypted to me. Yeah, it should be doing happening automatically, and it's not. So I will get back to you guys on that one. Oh, that's interesting, eh? Nah. Uh, no. No. It is definitely encrypting it. So, so much for that demo. That went as well as a, f a lead balloon. Normally that password would be encrypted, just so you know. I'm not sure what happened. Like I said, I'll go dig around. I'm running there. It's a Ubuntu 14. What system? That's the uh, Ubuntu 14. Ubuntu. It's Linux. Um, I've done these laps before, and that's exactly the command I used to do this, so I don't know why it didn't work this time. It should be entertaining. All right, moving on, because at this point, there's no point to keep talking about what the magic is if it's not working. Um, you can prompt it for what IDs a given user belongs to. Uh, it's similar to groups. So if I did groups, Daniel G chose this, but if I can go... I think was it ID. It gives me numeric values for them instead. So you can see that I belong to group ID 1000, group 4, group 24, group 27, 46. That's all the groups I belong to. If you don't provide the user, it assumes the current user, so it shows you who you belong to. SU. You've seen me type in the SU command a few times. SU stands for switch user. And it allows you to switch from one user account to another so you can become someone else. If you use the dash, so if I went, if I go SU dash, come on, Daniel G., it assumes that I'm going to actually execute Daniel G's uh, bash login script. So there's, every user has a, dash, a dot bash RC file. I'll show you guys what it looks like in a minute. And when you use the dash to the S2 command, it will execute the contents of that file. So it's as if you literally logged in as the person. And when you're root and you issue the S2 command, you can become the other person. You're literally the other user for all intents and purposes. Especially if you use a, the dash. 
That means you're also in inheriting all the environment variables, all their paths, all their groups, any customizations they did to their login script, uh, any aliases they've created for themselves, all gets created. So you become the person entirely. And the other scary thing is, if you're root, and you say you want to become someone else, it doesn't ask you for a password. So I could log in as I was root, and I became Daniel G. Never even asked me. I just became such. And I can go, who am I? Oops. I'm Daniel G. That's who I am. Yes. Well, inherit in the temporarily, it's temporary. As in, you've become that person. No, no. If you, if you just do an SU without the dash, it uses the current user's login shell. So if I'm logged in with root and I'm using, say, ZSH, and I SU into someone else, I am continue using ZSH and my paths. However, if you use the dash, I basically, for all intents and purposes, if I go SU dash, whatever your name is, I am now you. I, I have lost my paths temporarily until I exit. Until I pull an alien and I pull out of him, just go back out. And basically, I possess him temporarily. But the cool part is, is he can go around doing whatever the heck he does and keep working as himself the whole time, and I can S you and become him, and now there's two of us running around. And as far as the system's concerned, that's perfectly allowed. If you really want to mess with someone, it's a great way to mess with them. You wait till they log in, you S you, and you start changing files that they're working on. It's cool. You shouldn't. Oh, yeah, did you? Is there a setting? Yeah, go figure. Ah, uh, do you want to just shoot me an email? Okay, I'll take a look. But you still shoot me an email with that article. That way at least I'll, I'll share it with everybody else. So that's SU. It opens what's called a subshell. So it's basically you become another one. Um, now, if I'm Daniel G, and I want to become John Doe, I have to know John Doe's password, and I don't remember what the heck I said it to. Okay, I have that. So, if you're not root, and you want to become someone else, you have to know their password. You can't assume somebody else's identity without their permission, or at least having their password. If you're root, you can assume anybody's identity. And now for a quick summary, the user add uses a user, adds a user, user del removes a user, pass w changes a password, user mod modifies the account information as applicable, group, group add, group del, a new group. Uh, you can add a group, remove a group, list what groups you are, change what group you're operating as. Uh, G password is to de designate who's an administrator for a group, if anybody, anybody belongs to that group, et cetera. ID shows you the IDs the group a person belongs to. And that brings me to 522, which is too late to start the rest of this presentation, which is almost where I wanted to end today. It's exactly where I wanted to end today anyways. Now, um, like I said, you should be working on lab four. You should start taking a look at the hybrids. Let me pop into... Um, Blackboard. Now, when you look at the hybrids, for those that haven't looked in here, there's hybrid lectures. And it says you can do these in any order you want. However, I'd strongly recommend looking at the first one and reading through uh, this one. 
could be a kind of an important thing to look at. Um, system services is important. Scheduling and states is important, and processes are important. This used to be the content that before this course had a hybrid, where you had a text we had a textbook for, and you had to read like chapters and chapters and chapters every week. Um, instead, instead of talking about the boring stuff like processes. Uh, you get to learn about the commands and watch Dan not type the commands in right, um, which is entertaining unto itself. The, um, but you really need to look at these. I recommend reading through these definitely before the midterm, the first midterm, which is in, if I remember right, three weeks. I, I'll get back to you. I have to double check when, when it's scheduled. Yeah, pretty much. Um, I just got to make sure I get through the, the appropriate presentations to get there. Um, the quizzes, not so important. However, you'll see right here that there's Vim Tutor files. You'll probably want to start looking at these. I actually am looking for a really good Vim tutorial online for you guys uh, because the ones that these are, they're good as a reference. They're not good as a um, how to learn how to use this. Um, I've looked at a couple of VI tutorials over the uh, over the last week, and they were all kind of sketchy. Um, it's uh, they were. It's almost like they were written by someone who knows VI and assumes whoever's using it also knows VI. It's a bit like a recursive function. You only understand a recursive function when you understand a recursive function. And the VI tutorials were bad. They're almost as bad as the Emacs tutorials. Um, but as soon as I find a good one, it actually is on my priority list of things i got to dig for. I'll be sending uh, one out to you guys. Um, but there are some basic commands, and I'll actually go through them um, soonly with you guys, what the basic commands are for VI even though they're not on any of the slides. Uh, VI is the best. And it's also going to make you cry. Um, but it's a really cool editor. Okay. So let me just hit the stop button here.